Okay, this is the seventh lecture in a series about creating an international sustainable civilization. Um, this lecture is about um, how, how God is understood in the 21st century. So there, there are many different uh, threads to this point of view. I know that Antonio Damasio has argued for a monistic kind of view of God based on neuroscience, which I will present in a later lecture. This one, this lecture and the previous one are about God as understood at a, as a metaphysical principle, as underlying the sciences. And um, the previous lecture talked about the 20th century with Whitehead, Paul Davies, a quantum physicist, and um, Feynman, who's also a quantum physicist in the 20th century, arguing for an ultimate ordering force, a first mover. And then this lecture is about the 21st century. So it's two strains of um, inquiry or paradigm shifts that one of them is systems thinking, Frithoff Capra and Luisi Luigi, and they give a very comprehensive view of how we need to think in terms of systems. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We need to think, they actually go back to Aristotle to their surprise, I think, when they um, started inquiring about this. So biology, has led them to an Aristotelian notion of causality and being, which makes sense since Aristotle was a biologist and also Aristotle was an ecologist, environmentalist. So uh, Capra and Luigi especially emphasize the need to integrate nature and culture. So their book on systems thinking is called a unifying, uh, the system's view of life, a unifying vision. And so their argument is that we have to go back to life as our metaphysical foundation, just like Whitehead did actually, an organistic view, organism type view of human nature. And then we would get to an understanding of um, what Whitehead called his principle of his first principle. And then um, Luigi and Luisi uh, and Capra also come to a new view of uh, how to incorporate Aristotle's view of science into what we are discovering now. And the second one is um, Heinrich Paz. He is a quantum physicist. His view is that monism, the view that an underlying unity is the best hypothesis for explaining quantum physics, which is where I left off last time. Um, all right, so let me start. Oh, I do want to point this out, is that this is the um, YouTube channel where I have posted uh, this series of videos. I intended to post it on my other YouTube channel, and I hope I can find someone who'll help me do it. But for now, this is it. And um, so there it is, creating an international sustainable civilization. Um, all right. So this is the list of 42 lectures, so we're on number seven. There they are. I mean, there's a lot of them. So that's where we're going. Lots of different dimensions to this lecture series. Um, and... Okay, here we go. Okay.
All right, so let me try again. Okay. Um, so Ponchasilla, first principle number one, remember was religious pluralism, the belief in God, but it had to include Hindu, Confucius, Buddha, Islam, Protestant, Catholic, and tribal religions. And so these views coming from quantum physics and biology and multiple disciplines. So Capra and Luigi really go through how the paradigm in chemistry has changed, the paradigm in genetics, the paradigm in, in many, many of the scientific disciplines, the paradigm in healthcare, the paradigm in social science. Um, so it's multifaceted. It starts out with uh, biology and looking at human beings as biological creatures so that all of the social systems need to be related to us as organisms who are social and political by nature. So that's another basic understanding of humanity that Capra and Luigi also are reaffirming and recognizing that it is Aristotelian. So Aristotle knew quite a bit um, that we threw out in the Enlightenment, and now we're gradually recovering it. They also are recovering the other ancient wisdom traditions in various aspects of them. Um, so this is, I will emphasize, I can only do a very small portion of what they were up to, but this is what I will do. Okay, so the emerging new scientific conception of life can be seen as part of a broader paradigm shift from a mechanistic to a holistic and ecological worldview, a change from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a network. This is really important. The basic tension is one between the parts and the whole. The emphasis on the parts has been called mechanistic, reductionistic, or atomistic. Um, okay, and that's where empiricism. So he's also rejecting an uh, material uh, empiricist, enlightenment empiricism that reduced everything to the material parts. Um, the emphasis here is on the whole, holistic, or organismic or ecological. In the 20th century science, the holistic perspective has become known as systemic, and the way of thinking it implies is systems thinking. So again, this is a very Aristotelian. Aristotelian was a, Aristotle was a holistic thinker. He thought systematically. Just in my presentation of his virtues, you could see that it's very systematic and it's very holistic and the virtues interact with each other to develop a character, a person's character. Their character is formed within a culture. Some cultures are more just than others because of the way people treat each other. Some cultures are more are healthier than others because they need to be integrated with nature. So the basic Aristotelian view is very holistic and organismic. Okay, Aristotle, and then they point this out. So I knew this, you know, before I got to the point where they actually recognize this, which is nice. Aristotle, the first biologist in the Western tradition, distinguished between four causes as interdependent sources of all phenomena, the material, the formal, the efficient, and the final. The first two refer to the two perspectives of substance and pattern, which following Aristotle, we shall call the perspective of pattern and the perspective of form. Chinese philosophy and science were always more concerned with the inner relationships between things than with their reduction to a fundamental substance. From its beginning in the sixth century BC, Greek philosophy and science understood the order of the cosmos to be that of a living organism rather than a me mechanical system. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Christian medieval philosophers, unlike their Arab counterparts, did not use Aristotle's text as a basis for their own independent research, but instead evaluated them from the perspective of Christian theology. So in 1250, when Aristotle's work was rediscovered and retranslated, uh, Thomas Aquinas synthesized Aristotle with Christianity, and then the church became very powerful. And so the church co-opted Aristotle, and that's what set up this uh, animosity between science and religion. The church stonewalled it whenever the scientists found out something that conflicted with Aristotle, even though I've argued that Aristotle would agree with quite a bit of what they're doing, Aristotle would disagree with the machine, the world as a machine, and he would disagree with reductionism, but he would agree with uh, Copernicus uh, hypothesis. He would disagree with any a priori categories of reason, and he would disagree with material causes apart from formal and final causes. So everything for Aristotle, you can ask why it, it's, and the reason is it's aiming for its own perfection, for its kind of flourishing. Um, but what happened in the West was this fusion of science and theology. Any contradiction by future scientists would have to be seen as heresy. In this way, Thomas Aquinas enshrined the writings, in his writings, the potential for conflicts between science and religion, which have continued to the present day. So this is a real Achilles heel of the West, is ironically, Thomas Aquinas was very progressive. His work was almost considered, well, it was heretical, it was heresy. Somehow politically, they managed to get it through. But once it became the norm, then anything outside of a Thomistic interpretation of Aristotle became heresy. So uh, the new way of thinking, systems thinking, is based on Aristotle's principle in the metaphysics. Quote, in the case of all things which have several parts, the whole is not, as it were, a mere heap, but the totality is something besides the parts. So it rejects materialism. Okay. The new scientific understanding of life at all levels of living systems, organisms, social systems, and ecosystems, is based on a perception of re reality that has profound implications, not only for science and philosophy, but also for politics, business, healthcare, education, and many other areas of of everyday life. Ultimately, deep ecology, ecological awareness is spiritual awareness. When the concept of the human spirit is understood as the mode of consciousness in which the individual feels a sense of belonging, of connectedness to the cosmos as a whole, it becomes clear that ecological awareness is spiritual in its deepest essence. Hence, the emerging new vision of reality based on deep ecological awareness in, is consistent with the so-called perennial philosophy of spiritual traditions. So this fits in with Aristotle's idea of a first mover as nous, mind, and then the ability of the human mind, that what should be the first mover in a human being's life is also their idea of the good. They're supposed to imitate the universe by uh, trying to flourish to the highest level possible, constantly emerging, you know, at higher levels of human flourishing. And that is a perennial philosophy that goes right back to religious pluralism, Ponchicilla number one. So once again, just in what these writers say, Aristotle has been connected to uh, religious pluralism. So you have Ponchicilla principle number one and two being confirmed. So this one is Heinrich Paz, his defense. In his defense of the existence of one ultimate ordering force, 
he examines the history of this idea, monism. So Paz himself is a quantum physicist. The results from quantum physics are the hypothesis that there is a one underlying principle. So monism in ancient Egypt was symbolized by the goddess Neth. Um, and again, this is a goddess. So this is um, what I, I also think is important that we should, I myself as a child thought of God as energy, but most people have to personify. And even I have decided because of the patriarchy that I live in, that I need to personify uh, this energy as a goddess, a woman, because the force of life and the force of nurturing, the force of this unending cornucopia of life is, is much more like a goddess, the great womb that delivers life. So the image of life that we're talking about an organistic look, view of reality. And so if we're going to talk like that, we should envision it in some way, because if you just use the word God, that has been so associated with patriarchy and men that that will be the association. So I think we should, excuse me, really use a word, a goddess word. So I call the ultimate force, the great goddess. Um, and that triggers, hopefully for me, I had three children, so it's pretty obvious, but it should trigger this um, putting uh, life and being and the universe as it's emerging uh, cornucopia of being and then on earth it's of living being and just that idea of giving and giving and giving of life is really important and that's very that has to be associated with women if you have to personify it um the upanishads of hinduism symbolized by brahma okay so that goes that is a male but he has a counterpart female so the three main forces in hinduism are brahma vishnu the brahma being vishnu the preserver um and or, yeah and then shiva the destroyer so you destroy maya material in order to get to the Atman, the deeper energy. Um, but each of them also has a female counterpart. So um, it is, you know, the male comes up ahead uh, as a little more equal than the female, but at least there are female energies related to them, these energies all along the way. So Latsu in the Tao Te Ching, Buddhism, uh, Christian mysticism, Islamic Sufism, and Sikhism. So he's discovering, you know, there's many, many kinds of monism. Um, he did not go as far back as to put the goddess, the cultures that honored the great goddess, which those cultures lasted for 30,000 years before men came along and uh in, you know, created uh, views of the cosmos that personified the energy as male, which I think is unfortunate. I also think we really need to change quickly. Anyway, it's not unlikely that monism emerged in various cultures and geographic regions independently that it constituted a universal primal concept. So again, you can say for 30,000 years, monism existed as a universal primal concept of the great goddess. And so it's only, I think, in the emergence of patriarchy that it gets to be uh, questioned, right? Whether monism is the ultimate way to look at things. The idea of such a hidden fundamental reality didn't exhaust the similarities of modern physics and ancient mythology. Just like quantum mechanics, the monistic philosophies knew a concept of complementarity. 
the fundamental Brahma, Tao, or one, was a conjunction of opposites. And so, of course, one of those opposites is male, female, the one and the many. Um, anyway, so that's how uh, the female energies got connected to the male energies, but it was a transition from goddess. So in the goddess um, traditions, and I do, I wrote a book related to the goddesses and on my YouTube channel related to Greek philosophy. So uh, Dr. Martha Catherine Beck, Greek philosophy. There is a whole playlist about feminist union psychology. So it is about um, the goddess and seeing the universe that way. I do think we would treat nature a lot better if we envisioned it as a great goddess. Um, okay. All right. So compliment. Oh, actually in the goddess centered, um, the she gives birth to the god. It's just that she's the one who gives birth to the man. This happens in Hesiod also, which I think is really interesting because they're very aware at Delphi, Hesiod, all, the myths are, many of them are very aware of this transition from goddess-centered to um, male-centered. The Oracle at Delphi is about the replacement of the goddess worship center in Delphi with the worship of Apollo, god of reason. But there's many, many indications that the poets, the intellectuals are sending this message that now you protect the goddess with reason, but you don't harm the goddess with reason. And that message gets sent over and over. And I think the poets inherited that insight and they write all these things they write about men being hubristic, power hungry, money hungry, violent is their warning. You know, they're saying, look, this transition has been made to Apollonian reasoning as the driving force behind culture, but you cannot destroy the goddess. So again, we're back to that whole theme of the integration of nature and culture and the need for a sustainable culture and how even the Greeks in 800 BC were aware that this could really get out of hand. Um, okay, so let's see. All right, so the idea of a hidden fundamental, I would say, you know, it goes back way back. 35,000 years ago. Um, then how this tradition uh, was preserved in the Mideast, first by Persians, and then after the life and death of Muhammad by Muslims. So Plato's Academy in Athens was shut down by the Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian because of this horrible dichotomy between philosophy and religion, which is terrible, the West has this disease about this. And um, I just think Indonesia's got something to offer. It's just a, a holdout from the past. And um, it's really hard for us culturally to change. Um, its remaining members first found asylum in the court of Persia's philosopher king, who founded an academy to have Plato and Aristotle translated into Persian. And a year later, in a town near uh, today's Turkish border with Syria, a new academy was founded that existed for 400 years and may have inspired the Islamic Golden Age with monistic philosophy. So that would be translated into Arabic. In the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire in the Islamic world, Monistic philosophy and antiquities knowledge were preserved for posterity. Unlike the Christian, this is really important, the Muslim intellectuals preserved, revived, and developed much of Greek science, philosophy, and art that they found in their newly claimed territories. 
In the 8th century, the Caliphs established the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, a research and learning center equipped with a library based on the model of Plato's Academy in Athens or Alexandria's Museum. Alexander set up when he um, conquered the world, basically. Similar institutions such as the House of Knowledge in Cairo and the Houses of Wisdom in Southern Spain followed. Some of these places became strongholds of monistic philosophy. And I would also say of Greek humanism, which is really important, the notion of humanity and pluralism. Again, religious pluralism and humanism in this Greek sense was preserved for centuries and centuries. Um, al Kindus translated Greek books into Arabic in his treatise on first philosophy, he writes that oneness is in all things and concludes that thus there necessarily exists a true one whose unity is not an effect, right? It's the cause. It's the ultimate first principle. Aristotle calls it a, a pure actuality um, with no potential. Um, Avicenna agreed with Neoplatonism Platonism, that there's a principle of unity in the cosmos. The very existence of being of the cosmos overflows or emanates from the one. The monistic tradition in Islam is also evident in its mystic variety known as Sufism, revealed by the poet Rumi. In Western Europe, however, most of the tradition was lost. Monism was deified, made into Christian, the Christian God, or demonized, um, right, as anti-Christian, um, but almost always pushed into an uh, otherworldly realm, okay? So reason and faith, even in St. Thomas's view, he had a lot of overlap, but ultimately faith came before reason. Um, so for example, the Trinity, the idea that Jesus was God, is anti-reason, and it's anti-Greek humanism. There's no way. The Greeks thought we have minds, and we make ourselves a microcosm and the macrocosm, and we do that through understanding everything. But the notion that Jesus is God, thats it's designed to be anti-reason. And also that God would intervene in history at various times. That's completely incompatible with Greek humanism in terms of a view of reality. But, um, so that's just always been an incredible problem. But every religious tradition has its branches that are anti-wisdom. They're not just anti-knowledge, anti-reason. They're anti-wisdom. And it's just blind faith. And then religious leaders, political leaders can really manipulate people if they assume or play upon the belief that faith is blind. Um, okay, so monism books of antiquity survived the fall of Rome by being preserved in Constantinople and the Islamic world. Very important. Monism and human psychology. So this is not the psyche is a blank slate, and it's not Kant's a priori categories of reason. It's the mind as a microcosm and the macrocosm, an intuitive connection with the universe and the energy underlying and unifying material things. The astounding parallels between what we know about quantum reality and altered states of consciousness. It's not entirely impossible that subjects experience a quantum holism in altered states of consciousness, including what has been understood as mystical experience from the beginning of time. Alternatively, maybe humanity somehow preserved some unconscious member about being uh, memory, about being one with nature from primordial times, prim primordial times when individuation wasn't fully developed. Well, I mean, I would say in the West, individuation is uh, overdeveloped, it's perverse. The, the uh, belief in, in the individual isolated from community 
is uh, is an abstraction. Like it is not the way people live. It's not who people are. And so, you know, when he says individuation wasn't fully developed, that's pretty ambiguous because I would say the view we have now is, is based on materialism, consumerism. Um, it's not, it's not accurate and it's doing a lot of damage. Um, the other, the next uh, issue would be indigenous knowledge, right? So we are, again, going back, we need to preserve the knowledge of the integration of nature and culture that indigenous peoples have, the people who still have um, ownership of the land that they live on. We have to recover some of that. And um, we also have a lot to learn from tribes that are more egalitarian and more actually less sexist than a lot of the Western supposedly sophisticated and developed um, cultures that have arisen since then. So we need to recover some of the mistakes we made in the past and develop uh, a comprehensive view. So that's another reason why Indonesia's Panchasila, they recently added tribal traditions, indigenous traditions, and that's a good addition because we definitely need to in incorporate that into a international sustainable civilization in the next, in the future, from now to the future. The and so the most dispassionate hypothesis to explain the universe as we understand it today is monism. This is conclusion. Just like Whitehead said about Aristotle, Aristotle's positing of a prime mover was motivated only by intellectual inquiry, didn't have any other ulterior motives. So the main message of this book is that monism is indeed fruitful for science. It follows straightforwardly from quantum mechanics taken seriously. It provides a philosophical framework for a more most recent work in quantum gravity and a new perspective needed to approach the fundamental problems in particle physics and cosmology. There exists solid evidence that monism is at least a promising hypothesis. I regard monism as the best motivated and most promising candidate for a principle defining the foundations of physics that we have. So, so um, that's this lecture. This is the second lecture about monism. It's about the 20th century science, 21st, and um, on into the future. But I would say there's plenty of evidence from many different disciplines in the sciences, social sciences, and humanities that the hypothesis of an underlying prime mover um, confirms links Bring, makes intelligible all these other disciplines we have. And the fact that we have multiple disconnected disciplines was based on the view that we were reductionist and we were gathering data from all over the place without any really desire to get it to interrelate, especially not to the past, because we were going to use behavior modification to re-engineer the human psyche so we could create an entirely new culture. So of course, everybody's doing their own thing and trying to find out if this or that should be part of the new, brave new world. Um, and I just think that was a mistake because we forgot about our basic drives and we haven't been trying to educate those drives through the arts. And we forgot about an ultimate underlying force behind nature, so we haven't been paying to attention to that. And we're destroying what it is we have known. It's much harder to predict what nature will do to try and uh, save herself, to find a way to, to live, 
in the midst of all this destruction. So we shall see what happens. It's just that there is a way out and there is a way to re-examine what we've done and to change and to develop a systems paradigm and a monistic paradigm. Okay, so that's, that is that lecture. The next lecture is about the political implications of monism. And it recognizes, Mr. Paz recognizes that if a politician gets an idea of monism in their head, they will use it to proclaim, you know, that my tradition is true monism and everybody else. I mean, it, it can lend itself to authoritarianism. And so, but if it, monism as it actually is, the natural inference is pluralism. Because if there is an ultimate first principle, then all the differences between us are irrelevant or secondary. They're not important. They appear to be different, but they're not. So even the differences between monotheism and the Jewish idea of God, the Christian idea, the Muslim idea, um, the Hindu view of Brahman, these are all just different cultural articulations or different cultures formed because human beings are all over the planet. They all wanted, they all had this perennial philosophy, this idea of an underlying force. So monism ought to lead to tolerance, but it has to be taken with a lot of caution because it can easily be abused. And I think it was abuses of the belief in a hierarchy and the belief in, it was abuses of that that led to colonialism and all sorts of um, oppression and injustice, which is why a lot of um, enlightenment intellectuals threw out the whole thing. They threw out the baby with the bathwater and they thought they could end up with democracy or with a free society if they just posited freedom and equality rather than positing an ultimate first principle, our ability to understand it, our natural desire to increase in wisdom over time on the assumption that we, we uh, there are better and worse ways to live. Moral relativism is not the final say. There are better and worse judgments to make in a situation. There are better and worse ways to be a parent or a coach or anything. Um, but that means people are unequal in their judgments, their practical wisdom. They can educate each other, but the assumption is we have to seek wisdom and we have to seek out people who are wise. We can't just assert that we're free and equal and individuals and we have rights and we just go and do whatever we want and don't listen to anybody. That's not viable. It might have seemed to be more egalitarian. It perhaps people wanted to avoid all those, all the bigotry, the bias, the prejudice, the colonialism, but that doesn't work either. So I think we just have to make distinctions all the way along and figure out how to form an international civilization today. And we have to talk to each other and call out particular insights that, you know, we had not had before. And then on the other hand, call out prejudices or ignorance or things you're not considering. Um, so it's complicated. It's a long process, but the love of wisdom. That's why Socrates says, I am not wise. I'm a lover of wisdom. And the Oracle at Delphi said, there's no one wiser than Socrates. And he was totally shocked. He's just a stone cutter. But he said, I guess, I, I guess after talking to all these other people, the only reason the Oracle said no one is wiser than I am is because when I don't think when I don't know something, 
I don't think I know it either, where everybody I talk to thinks they knows they know things. And when I question them about it, they don't really know what they think they know. And so I guess I'm wiser than them. <laughs> but I think in this process of creating an international sustainable civilization, we ought to make sure that we love wisdom. We don't um, think we know what we don't know. We don't mind getting exposed for our ignorance, which I'm sure, you know, many of these lectures, I, I mean, I guess it's obvious to me, I can only touch on a very few points in each lecture. And it's more like how all the parts fit together. So I'm definitely open to expanding and learning more at any point. Um, and that's exciting to me. This is a big project, obviously. So, all right. The next lecture is about the political side of monism and being careful about that.